All right, so there we go. So once again, welcome. My name is Jamie Vivak, and this is the Conservation Foundation's webinar series. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and use that Q&A box. That lets everyone see your question, and it also makes it easier for us to find them all, because questions can just sometimes get lost in the chat. But we'll make sure to answer them uh, whenever we see them at the end of the presentation. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat as well while Brooke is speaking. So if there's any little questions here and there or clarifications and things, I may be answering them um, there as well. For your safety, you should only be able to see what I post in chat, but just in case I missed a setting, please don't click on any links other than what I might post in the chat. So on the Conservation Foundation side of things, these webinars are offered to the public for free. However, we do encourage you to consider a donation or membership. The more people we have attending, the more it costs us to run them. So at the end of the webinar, you're gonna be taken to a page with a whole bunch of resources of things you might be interested in. Um, our link to rain barrels, our link to native plant guides, things like that. Um, but there's also gonna be our virtual tip jar. So if you're enjoying these webinars, I encourage you to donate to help keep us running. And that also will make you a member so that you can enjoy our wide variety of members only stuff. So I mentioned this is a twice weekly series. And so Thursday, we're gonna be joined by the International Dark Sky Association to uh, and talk about saving dark skies and the importance of the Dark Skies Initiative. So that's going to be a really fun one. I'm looking forward to that. On Monday, June 15th, we'll be joined by Jennifer Hammer, uh, another TCF staffer, to find out how clean is your stream. So she's going to be talking about um, all kinds of things about how you can help to keep your local rivers and streams clean, as well as how we monitor them and how we figure out how clean streams are. And then also next week on Thursday, finally got someone to help me do a native landscape design one. As I've said several times, I know my native plants, but I am not an artist. I don't have a background in native landscape design or in um, any kind of landscape design. So um, Nancy Sonato, another TCFer who does have that experience, is going to be talking about how to design your native landscape garden. So I know that's something many people have been asking for. So I look forward to that for next week. So please make sure you put that on your calendar and join us for that. Now, with all that out of the way, I am going to turn it over to our illustrious CEO, Brooke McDonald. Welcome, Brooke. Hello, thank you, Jamie. And hello, everyone. I'm glad you're able to join us today. With all the craziness going on, I'm glad to be talking about something fun. And so I hope you'll you'll enjoy this and, and learn some things. and. Uh, We'll try to answer uh, all your questions. Jamie, I believe we also have a link uh, to a page on our website where we have a, a summary of our study, our polling study uh, that people can, can download. It's a PDF. Uh, everything I'm gonna say to, today is, is in that study. Plus there's a lot more data, a lot more information in that, in that study. And if you don't feel like uh, reading 21 pages, which I think is approximately how long it is, really the first three pages are the most important uh, in this. So, uh, so if, if you read that and look it over, it'll repeat a lot of the things that I said today. So I'm going to share my screen, Jamie. And everybody see that okay? You're good. Okay, very good. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the language of conservation, and uh, we've been doing this kind of work for quite a long time. What words, what phrases do people resonate with? Uh, what do people care about more than other things in, in, as it relates to conservation and specifically land conservation, because that's our mission. I do want to give a shout out to the Gaylord and Dorothy Donnelly Foundation for funding this study uh, that we did about a year ago. Uh, a little bit about the Conservation Foundation. We're a 501c3, been around for nearly 50 years. Our mission really is about improving the health of our communities. We preserve and restore land. We clean up our rivers and streams, and we promote stewardship of our environment. And we are an accredited land trust through the Land Trust Accreditation Commission. <clears throat> uh, the, our four main areas we focus on as a not-for-profit organization uh, again, land, land preservation and restoration, cleaning up our rivers and streams. We do a lot of environmental education uh, with kids uh, and families and a lot of community education and outreach. 
Our primary territory is DuPage, Kane, Kendall, and Will counties in northeastern Illinois, but we also do some work in DeKalb, LaSalle, and in Grundy County. So about seven counties, but our four main counties are DuPage, Kane, Kendall, and Will. And we are headquartered at a 60-acre organic vegetable farm here in Naperville, Illinois. Over the past uh, four and a half, almost five decades now, we've been all involved uh, in preserving about 35,000 acres of land. Uh, now it's well over 200 parcels, about 45 conservation easements in actually eight different counties right now. So even though uh, we focus on DuPage, Kane, Kendall, and Will, uh, we go where we're needed and we help other organizations where we can be of added value. And um, there's a rich history in Northeastern Illinois in particular of the public willing to pay and their desire to preserve more open space. Um, over the past 25 years or so, about 1.5 billion, and that's with a B, 1.5 billion dollars have been approved by voters throughout Northeastern Illinois, mostly in the collar counties, uh, to preserve open space and uh, protect uh, natural areas. Now, these are people who are going to the ballot box. And while many of them may say no to good things like schools and fire and libraries, they're not saying no to open space. And uh, you know, for example, um, over the past 25 or so years, there have been 41 conservation ballot measures on the ballot. 37 have passed, that's 90%. The national uh, passing rate or approval rate is about 70%. So here in Northeastern Illinois, uh, we exceed the national uh, statistics in terms of um, how many of these have been passed. Um, and most of these pass two to one, they're not even close. So we do have a rich history that goes back to Daniel Burnham well over a hundred years ago of uh, wanting green space, preserving land, and for people willing to pay for it. Those referenda that have passed, those 37 referenda, have just by that alone, they've protected about 45,000 acres of land in Northeast Illinois. Um, so that's a lot of money and that's a lot of acres. The Conservation Foundation, one way that we help preserve land is we work with park and forest preserve districts to help them pass these referenda. So when a park or a forest preserve district, when they decide to put something on the ballot, they oftentimes will call us and say, hey, will you guys uh, help pass this and get the word out? Uh, we've been involved in well over 20 campaigns over the past 25, uh, almost 30 years now. Our first one was in uh, 1997. So we have quite a bit of experience uh, on how to position the messages and to encourage voters to voluntarily raise their property taxes to preserve things like open space. In fact, some of the counties are here. DuPage has passed two. Will a couple. Kendall's passed two. Kane County's passed six. Lake County five. McHenry two. Even DeKalb County uh, passed a forest preserve referendum. And there have been various in park districts and townships also pass open space referenda. Not just a park referendum. I'm talking about ones that had a significant open space preservation component to it. So again, a rich history in Northeastern Illinois of voters supporting these types of ballot measures. We collect data whenever we get involved in these campaigns. Uh, we spend about $15,000 and we go out ahead and we collect polling data. We want to know going in, what are the odds of it passing? What are the strong messages? What are messages against the referendum? What are messages for the referendum? This is the shelf literally right behind me right now. And um, I have about a uh, quarter of a million dollars worth of polling data that we've collected over the past 25 or so years. And it's great because we collect the data, we use it, we pass a referendum, it passes, everybody's happy, we go out and we have some beers, and then the, the data just simply sits on a shelf, literally, as you see in the picture right here. So um, we have all this data. It's a shame that we really only use it once. And so a few years ago, uh, we were talking about how can we go back and mine that data a little bit more and come up with some um, history or some longitudinal analysis of how the messages and the demographics have changed over the past 25 years. 
And so uh, we felt that we needed to do an updated poll, which we did in April of 2019. So we had current year data, this was a year ago, and uh, to be able to compare how the messages and how the demographics have changed, the voter demographics over the past 25 years, or have they changed at all? And of course, this was a year ago, so this was all pre-COVID and all of the, uh, the other things that are going on right now. So um, obviously we live in a different world today than we did a year ago. How this new world affects these messages and the data, I really don't know for sure. Um, we have been through uh, economic ups and downs in the past. And you know, one thing that has been consistent over the past 25 years is you know, whether the economy's good, whether the economy's bad, whether there's political turmoil, no political turmoil, it's been pretty consistent that people continue to demand and are willing to pay for the preservation of open space. So this study uh, really attempts to answer the following question here. How do we talk to people about conservation in a way that connects with their values, their interests, and their concerns? So that's what we were trying to do by looking back at all of the previous year's data and the data that we collected in April of 2019. So even though we're using polling data, we're really not talking about how to pass a referendum. We're talking about how do we use all of this rich data and how do we analyze it historically to current day to better understand how to talk to people about conservation in ways that matter to them, not necessarily that matter to us. So we worked in the six uh, suburban collar counties, DuPage, Kane, Kindle, and Will. These are the four that are in our service territory. And we also added Lake and McHenry County. There are other groups like us that work in those counties, but because both Lake and McHenry had data uh, from previous polls, uh, we included them. So uh, all of the information I'm about to share with you uh, is, uh, pertains to the six collar counties in the suburban Chicago area. So what was the purpose of the study? The purpose was really to develop consistent regional messages that resonate with voters and the public. In other words, what are those high level important messages that everybody can talk about throughout the Chicagoland area that we know resonate with most people out there, especially voters. But we also wanted to look at specific county nuance data and messages. In other words, are there some nuances in terms of messaging in Kendall County as opposed to Lake County? Of course there are, because Kendall County is much different than Lake County. So we wanted to look at those also. So what are the broad regional messages that we all can use when we talk about the value of conservation and land conservation? And then what are some of those specific messages that might be nuanced based on the specific local county? We also wanted to update the polling data. It had been a while since uh, some polls had been done. And so uh, if we're going to go back and look at previous year's data, we wanted to have a good starting point. So we, we updated all the data in each of the six counties, uh, which helped us then go back and better analyze uh, the previous data. So we wanted to look at trends over the past 20 uh, plus years. And like I said earlier, we wanted to take an in-depth look at the voters. And the voters have changed. I can tell you that the suburban Collar County voter today is a lot different than it was when we first started doing this in 1997. And then just for fun, we wanted to make sure that the Forest Preserve Districts had information that they could use if they wanted to start a conversation about offering the public a referendum in either 2020 or 2022. I can tell you that there were a couple forest preserves pre-COVID that we're thinking about doing a referendum in November, 2020. And um, so uh, I, I, I don't think they're going to do that now for obvious reasons, uh, but there may be an opportunity for them to think about a 2022 referendum if they choose to do so. And if they do, they'll have some, some more recent data that they can pull from. So who was surveyed? Let me just get into a little methodology here so you understand that. Um, we talked to 1,200 voters, about 200 in each of the six collar counties. And it was very important for us to compare apples to apples, current data with previous data, 
to look at likely November 2020 voters. In other words, these are voters that are high frequency voters, voters who will likely be voting in a, an election in November 2020. And if you think about it, there are going to be a lot of people voting in November of 2020. So this is sort of what the demographic look like. Uh, when we do these polls, we want to make sure that we are uh, polling a representative sample of who will come out and vote. Uh, so it's about evenly split on gender. This is an area here, a uh, political affiliation that has changed drastically since we started doing this back in 1997. And uh, I don't need to get into a huge conversation about this, but um, you know, are the the suburban voter just looks a lot different than what it did 25 years ago. Again, mostly white, uh, married, and you can see the age ranges here. So this is, for you marketing people, this would be a psychographic of a November 2020 voter in the Chicago area. Okay, so the, um, the context of this was a hypothetical referendum, not a real referendum. And that's a little different because all of the past polls we've done, it was about a real referendum. So this was about a hypothetical referendum. And we, we wanted to do that. We wanted to context this right to make sure uh, that when we were going back and, and comparing the new data with the old data, that we were able to uh, compare apples to apples. Uh, in a 10 to 15 minute phone survey, randomly selected high frequency, likely November 2020 voters, we try to replicate a mini campaign in that. We test positive and negative arguments. Now, these are arguments that we know that people might hear uh, during a campaign. There are reasons for it. There are reasons against it. Uh, we test growth issues and what people's top concerns might be. And then we test various conservation messages. And then we're able to, to use the results of that to help us come up with a campaign communications plan. We test the support of this hypothetical referendum at both the beginning and the end. And this is sort of critical. So at the very beginning, we ask people, and at this point, they know nothing about the referendum. We give them a, a hypothetical referendum and would they support it? Yes, no, maybe. And then we go through the whole survey and at the very end, we say, hey, now that you know a little bit more about this, um, would you vote for it? Yes or no? And then we're able, able to compare the differences between how people reacted at the beginning of the survey and at the end and then what messages move different demographics from maybe an I don't know to a yes or a no to a yes, or in some cases a yes to a no. It just depends. Okay, so let's get into some of the data here, a little bit of history. Uh, prior to the uh, Great Recession of 2008, uh, when we asked people what their top concerns were, mostly they fell into what we call the growth issues, controlling growth and development, sprawl, traffic congestion, preserving open space and lands. About 39% of the people said that their top concerns fell in to one of these growth areas here. The economic issues, taxes, government spending, growth, jobs, about 30, and then you can see the rest. Interestingly enough, when we did this in April of 2019, we asked the exact same question. So the results, as you can imagine, were different. The economic issues were a lot more. Now, if you think about this, it makes sense. Even a year ago, um, you, the, uh, there's not a whole lot of development going on on the landscape. If you remember back prior to 2008, when the economy was rolling really well, subdivisions were popping up everywhere, and that concerned a lot of people. It caused a lot of flooding, a lot of traffic congestion. People, the, the world that people lived in was changing very rapidly. That stopped now. So you can understand why people's concern about growth and sprawl might be a little less now than it was 10 or 15 years ago education at 12, and then the growth issues come in at 11. And so this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I just think it reflects reality that prior to 2008, the economy was uh, rolling, lots of development, new homes popping up, new roads being built, and that's just not happening that much today. You can see how the rest sort of, how the rest pan out there. So pre-2008 and then 2019. Okay, so um, in the past, we have always seen a correlation between people's concern for sprawl and growth and their ability or their desire to want to vote yes for a referenda. All of the data 
that we've always done showed a direct correlation between people's concern for growth and development and their willingness to vote yes for an open space referenda. One of the questions we ask in all of our polls is do you feel your county is growing too fast, too slow, or at the right pace? So these are the numbers in our April 2019 poll for all six counties. 16% felt that their counties were growing too fast, 12% too slow, and 68 at the right pace. Now, let's compare these numbers to some of, of the past. So you can see the difference between people's concern for growth. In DuPage in 05, 46% of the people said it was growing too fast. So all these numbers are too fast numbers. 46% in 05 DuPage. Kane, 68% in 04 said that their county was growing too fast. 07 in Kendall, 78% of the people felt their county was growing too fast. And in Will County in 04, 56. So just look at those numbers for a minute and you can get an idea that people just aren't that concerned anymore about growth and development. It's not really happening that much now. I'm not saying it's not happening at all. I'm just saying it's not happening at the rate and speed that it was happening earlier in, in the decade, earlier in the century, late, late uh, 1990s, early 2000s. And this is important because what this has led to is something new that we've learned about voters and their concerns relative to preserving land. Just real quickly, um, if you just take a minute, look at this chart of all the people who said that their county was growing too fast, 71 said that they would support a hypothetical referendum. For those that said they were growing too slow, I can't see the number because this box in the way, I, there you go, I can move it. 76% um, said they would support it. And of the people who said their, their county was growing at the right pace, 71. So what this tells me is that although a while ago, there was a direct correlation between people's willingness to support an open space referendum and raise their taxes and pay for it was directly correlated with their perception or their perceived sense of urgency relative to land being developed quickly, sprawl, urban sprawl, that that does not exist anymore. And of course, this is just one data point. We will continue to ask this question as we move forward. What's good about this is that perhaps the pendulum has swung in that People support preserving land regardless of whether their community is growing fast or not. This is the first time that we saw the shift in the data from all of the other polling projects that we did. And so this is a good message that people see that preserving land in their community is a community value. And it doesn't matter whether there's sprawl occurring on the landscape or not, that people are willing to support and preserve open space. Now, you would think then a message such as controlling growth and slowing down urban sprawl is important to preserving land. If people's concern about sprawl is not that high, you would think that this message wouldn't be that strong. That you know, if we can preserve land as a way to control growth and slow urban sprawl. But that's not what the data shows. The data shows, and you can see that the first column is region wide and then each individual county. Even though people don't express a concern about sprawl, they still respond in a very positive way to a message that talks about how open space can be used to manage growth and slow urban sprawl. So I thought that was interesting. And we test economic concerns because in the end, people want to know, okay, yeah, I like open space. I like more parks and forest preserves, but how much is it going to cost me? So we really try to dive deep into what people's concerns are about their wallets. And so we've been asking these questions for years and we're able to track them. So we ask people to respond to questions such as, do you agree or disagree? We would be better off spending our money on more important things like education and economic development than purchasing more land. 
it's about split even i think our margin of error on this was around three three and a half percent so it's about 50 50. this one is always a good one our property taxes are already too high we need to draw the line on tax increases how can you disagree with that uh, who wants to pay more in property taxes property taxes are already too high and we need to draw the line on tax increases 74 agree with that statement 54 percent strongly agree with it but here's the kicker and we see this in every single poll we do people respond to this question or this 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 message about property taxes every single time just like this and then right after we ask this question we ask the following question and everyone responds exactly the same way every time two dollars a month is a small price to pay to preserve and protect open space and natural areas 80 percent of the people agree with that statement and 55 strongly agree now go back to that middle bullet read that again and then read the last bullet of course my property taxes are already too high we need to draw the line oh you just want two dollars a month for open space that's a value to me i can pay that now some people would not pay a dime more a year for open space and that's okay some people would pay more than two dollars a month but the vast majority of the people feel that a couple dollars a month on their taxes is no big deal because they like parks forest preserves and open space now, why do we pick two dollars because the average tax increase in these referenda that we've been doing the past 25 years the average annual increase to the average home in any of these counties is about 24 dollars a year so we could ask this question a different way is 24 dollars a year a small price to pay you know they, they would say yes we say two dollars a month just because it sounds better so let's get into what the messages really are here uh, so we ask a series of questions about approved uses of funds. In other words, if, if the referendum passed, what would be the things that you would like, mostly like used for with the money? What would, be those, what would be those things to use the money for? And I can tell you right now that the top uses of funds for any, any of these polls we've ever done has always been centered around water. That's consistent with national polling data, it's consistent with statewide data. It's been consistent with all of the data and all of the polling that we've done. So if you ever want to try to convince people that protecting our environment is important and that preserving land is important, start with talking about water. Open space protects drinking water. 92% approve the use of the money for that with 79 strongly approving. Protecting water quality, 91 and 74. So the numbers in the parentheses are the strongly uh, approved. And so we look at those, we, we look at not just the 91, but we wanna know how intense people are around their support of using funds for this. So intensity says a lot about how strong a message is, not just the overall number. Reduce flooding, preserving land reduces flooding 89 and 69 protecting wetlands 85 59 and then we put it all in a complete sentence protecting watersheds to improve water quality of rivers lakes and streams 90 and 70. so however you talk about this however you put these messages together in a sentence or in a paragraph they all relate to each other obviously because they're all related to water these are really really strong messages so whether you're at a company picnic or whether you're having a beer with your neighbor in the backyard or whatever, if the topic of preserving land comes up or someone says, hey, I like that new forest preserve down the road, say, yeah, you know what? That forest preserve really protects our drinking water. Clean water means good beer. So we also wanna uh, talk about protecting water quality and reducing flooding. We all know that parks and forest preserves are natural flood control. So there's all kinds of ways to tie and connect land conservation to water. And we know that people feel that their money that they once spent, they're most intense about using it around issues of clean water, flooding, anything to do with water. So water, water, water. There are lots of other strong messages. A nature education for kids. 
89% approved using the money that with 65 strongly approving. Air, uh, air, uh, air quality, so uh, air pollution and planting trees. Protecting wildlife. This is a number that we've seen increase over the years. Not that it was ever a low number, but we, when we first started doing this, the wildlife habitat, that number was down in the low 70s. It's almost at 90% now. Uh, people like wildlife. They like seeing deer. They like seeing uh, critters, uh, either in their neighborhood or in the forest preserves, especially kids. So this is, this is a really strong message when we talk about wildlife and wildlife habitat. Protect endangered species, just a caveat on this. Um, we found that there's a difference between the level of support between the suburban voter and the rural voter. In other words, those that live out mostly in agricultural areas. Now, it's not that people that live in agricultural areas don't you know, support a protecting wildlife habitat, but when it gets to endangered species, there's a political spin that is associated with that. Now, government uh, overreach, uh, taking land, uh, protecting a dragonfly over farming or, or, or whatever. Uh, so we have learned through the data and just from talking people to, to people that um, you know, if I'm talking to an agricultural community, I'm really not going to bring up endangered species. I'm going to focus on wildlife habitat. That preserving this land really helps enhance and protect wildlife habitat. They'll like that because many of them are hunters. In a suburban environment, we talk about both. We need to preserve this land because it protects wildlife habitat especially for endangered species. So that would be a nuance that you would wanna know uh, about and, and we see that in the data. Just generally protect natural lands, 84. Okay, and then there's a, a lot of really good messages around recreation. Everybody loves trails for walking and biking, 88% uh, uh, with 63 strongly. Uh, if you look at the survey work that the forest preserves do around the area, and uh, when they ask their residents what are, are the amenities that they want most in the forest preserves, it's always trails. Trails are always uh, one of the top things. And then also just outdoor recreation for fishing, hiking, and picnicking. Again, these are all benefits that we all get by preserving land, creating more parks and forest preserves. But these are also things that voters highly approve of to use their money for. Future generations. We owe it to our children and grandchildren to save our county's open space, clean water and wildlife, so future generations can enjoy them the way we do. This is a strong one. 91 agree, 72 strongly agree. And I will tell you a nuance on this message. Not that Democrats don't think this is a good message. They do. Republicans think that this is a message uh, that's very important to them also. In fact, Republicans scored higher on this than the Democrats. So if I'm talking to a group that I know that they're very conservative, whatever, I'm really gonna focus a lot on that we have a moral and ethical responsibility to preserve land for future generations so our children and grandchildren can enjoy that land just like we did when we were kids. This is a strong message in general. It's especially a strong message to more conservative voters. And if you're putting together a campaign, it's important to know those little nuances. Here's another way to say it. Our county's land, water, and wildlife are our natural heritage. Heritage is a powerful word to conservatives. And we have a responsibility to protect and preserve them for future generations. Again, 93 and 69. So both of these messages are very strong, um, stated one way or another, and understanding how a person's political view uh, can affect their interest in some of these messages is very important. Okay, so we all know that spending time outside is important to our health, our, our physical and our mental health, excuse me. We've never tested these messages before, so this is the first time we've done it. As we move forward with uh, more polling and more studies, uh, we'll continue uh, to dive into this. So again, you know, looking at a statement like this, in today's digital age, it is more important than ever to provide parks, playgrounds, youth sports and recreation programs, places where children can play and be physically active. 89 agreed with 70 strongly agreed. Now, we also ask this question a little different. 
to see if there'd be any, any interesting uh, nuances. Forest preserves, parks, and recreation areas play a vital role in fighting obesity, promoting the physical and mental health of the community. Now look at the results of this question as compared to the previous one. 79 agreed, which is good, but less than half strongly agreed. The above, you had 89 agreed with 70% strongly agreed. And the pollster and looking into the numbers felt that the first message, the one on top is a little bit more, it's a little easier for people to understand and more people can relate to that message than at the one at the bottom. The one at the bottom is the one that all of us conservation folks are pushing out there. It's not a bad message, but it's not as strong as the first message. Another nuance that the people who agreed with these messages the most were mothers with children and those over the age of 65. Now think about that for a minute. Mothers with children makes sense. You know, they're all about quality of life. They want their communities to be clean and healthy for their kids. But also older voters felt very strongly about these issues. They can certainly relate to some of this stuff. And we've all heard, probably heard ourselves or our parents or our grandparents talk about how kids sit on their butt, you know, too much and in front of the TV, the computer, or the phone, or whatever. You know, when we were younger, we didn't do that. We were always outside, just like they were. So, uh, you know, this could be a powerful message depending on what you're trying to achieve. So, you know, we, we talk a lot about quality of life and how preserving land improves our quality of life. So this here is a message that we've been using for years. It is a strong message. It's a high level message. And if anyone said, ask me, what is the one message that we should all be focused on in the Chicago region when we talk about things, it would be this right here, preserving natural lands, wildlife habitat, water resources, and providing outdoor recreation opportunities plays a very important role in preserving our quality of life. 90 degrees, 63 strong. So if you were to look at our campaign materials, if you look at our website, if you look about what we talk about at the Conservation Foundation, a lot of it is about quality of life, healthy communities. Um, that's what people really care about. Um, probably many people on this webinar right now are like me, you know, we're sort of down in the weeds and conservation, you know, pollinators and endangered species and, and insects, uh, stuff like that. And that's great, but everybody else is sort of at a higher level. If people are just trying to live and survive out there, this is the kind of stuff that people care about right here. So yeah, were there any surprises? Well, I talked about this, this lack of correlation anymore earlier between people's perceived sense of sprawl and development and whether they would support open space. That definitely has changed. I don't know if that's a surprise, but that was definitely something that changed. So we've always been told in the environmental communication business that there are bad words out there. There are just bad words. You just don't say certain words or certain phrases because people don't understand, they're controversial, just don't say this stuff. Well, that might be true for national data, but we decided to test some of these words to see if our folks were a little bit more educated, more enlightened about these issues, whatever. So we wanted to test them locally. So when we talked about people about whether they approve or disapprove of the use of their money, for creating and maintaining resilient and sustainable ecosystems, we got pretty strong response. 87 approved with 65 strongly. The words that are underlined are the words that we've been told by the experts not to use these words. I like these words. I think that in the Chicago suburban market, we have a highly educated community. And so I'm not afraid to use these words, resiliency, sustainability, and ecosystems. So that's what our data says. Maybe somebody else's data in a different region of the country would say something different, but I think we need to be uh, using these phrases. And then the other one, preserving land helps mitigate the effects of climate change. Yes, we need to be talking about climate change. It's not a controversial issue. Um, people can politicize it if they want, I don't care, but we need to be able to relate 
the how open space and preserving and restoring our natural lands, how that helps mitigate the impact of climate change. 73 approve with 54 strongly approving. So we should not shy away from these phrases, these topics, and these words, in my opinion. <clears throat> so let's get back to this hypothetical referendum. You know, would it pass? At the beginning of the survey, we asked people if they would support this hypothetical. You know, we actually had some uh, sample ballot language, and we read it. We didn't have an amount in there. We just said, hey, you know, the Forest Preserve, you know, thinking about uh, a possible hypothetical referendum. If it was held today, this referendum was held today to preserve land and clean up our rivers and streams, would you support it or not? 71 said yes, with 39 definitely saying yes. And this is really before knowing anything. When we told people it was going to cost them something, oh, it's going to cost me something. Oh, I'm sorry, before I get to that. So this is how it broke down per county. So you can see DuPage, King, Kendall. These are the six counties. So this was the, hypothet the hypothetical bond referendum initial ballot test by county. So you can see we started off with pretty strong support from likely November 2020 voters. Then we told them it was going to cost them something. We told them it was going to cost them $24 annually. And it dropped a little bit, 69. But look at the intensity. The intensity actually went up. So to me, if you're looking at this statistically, it really had no impact. It's about the same. It all falls within the margin of error. So the dollar amount didn't uh, affect people's support or not. By the end of the survey, once they learned more about what the money could be used for, and they were given an opportunity to chime in on that, support for a hypothetical referendum rose 76% with 43 definitely saying they would support it. Again, this was hypothetical. No one's planning, as far as I know, to have a referendum in November. Pre-COVID, I think there were a couple that were thinking about that. And again, the main purpose of the study was not really to assess that. It was really to look at the data and, and look at the messages. What are the messages that we should be talking about, regardless of whether there would be a referendum or not? And then we looked at the core analysis. And so core supporters there in the blue 41%, those are people that said yes at the beginning of the survey and yes at the end of the survey. If I was putting together a campaign plan, those are the people who I just need to get out to vote. I don't need to convince them to vote yes. They were with us before and at the end. They're solid yes voters. If you look at the red slice, 17%, 12%, I'm sorry. Um, those are the core opponents. These are people that said no at the beginning and no at the end. There are no voters. Don't waste any time on them. They're going to vote no. And then 46% is the battleground. And uh, whenever we see more than 35% on battleground, we know that it's a referendum that will likely pass. So with the battleground voters, these are people who were undecided or who changed their mind. They were not the core supporters, nor were they the core opponents. So, you know, a, a different set of messages would go out to this group as opposed to the core supporters. Of course, supporters just need to be reminded to vote. The battleground voters need a little convincing, and we'll know what messages would convince those based on the polling data. So let's focus on the quality of life messages here. So this is what we are encouraging people to talk about and think about this high-level messaging. Conserving open space lands plays a very important role in preserving our quality of life. That's the overall arcing umbrella message that everything else should fall under. It's about connecting land conservation to people's quality of life. It's as simple as that. It's not any more complicated than that. It's as simple as that. <coughs> Excuse me. Under that, we talk about linking open space with clean water. Open space land, especially along our rivers and streams, help protect water quality and our drinking water. Now, in more rural areas, people know their drinking water comes from the ground. I think in many of the communities, they get it from Lake Michigan. It doesn't matter. People respond well to the message of linking preserving land to their water, to their clean water. Clean land equals clean water. We want to link preserving land to clean air. Open space helps mitigate the negative impacts of air pollution, 
climate change, trees filter carbon dioxide out of, or out of the air, they give us oxygen back, so that whole cycle. Open space preserves wildlife habitat. Everybody likes warm and fuzzy critters. Everybody likes birds. Everybody likes monarchs. And now this year, everyone's liking the 17-year cicada, where, where we see them scattered around. Open space creates recreational opportunities where people can get outside and enjoy the great outdoors. And we want to link that to kids, getting kids outside, getting them more active outside in nature. It's healthy for them mentally and physically. <coughs> Excuse me. And then finally, we don't want to forget about this responsibility of preserving land for future generations. Again, it's a strong message for Democrats and independents, but it's even a stronger message for those that identify themselves as Republicans or more conservative voters. So some best words and phrases to try to work into your conversations with people. Again, I'm repeating myself, but I'm doing that on purpose. Clean water, water quality and drinking water. Link preserving and restoring the land to clean water and drinking water if you know that people get their drinking water from the ground. Link it to wildlife habitat. Link it to protecting wildlife habitat. So water and wildlife. And for those in more rural areas, preserving their way of life. This is what we call the three W's, water, wildlife, and way of life. <clears throat> clean air, we wanna breathe clean air. Preserving land helps clean our air. By planting trees, we're helping to clean our air. Healthy communities, we also wanna build healthy communities. Try to make it as local as possible. We added this to the beginning of our mission statement a few years ago because it answers the why of, of what we do. We preserve land and clean up our rivers and streams, but the reason we do it is because we're about helping to build and create healthy communities. Preserve land for future generations and make sure we're always talked about getting kids and families outside in nature. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So recommendations, you gotta make sure you know your audience. Um, if I'm gonna to talk to the Rotary Club, or if I'm talking to my neighbors, I'm talking to the Garden Club, I might talk differently to the Garden Club than I would the Rotary Club. Um, but knowing your audience will help you sort of craft your message and zero in on, on what to talk about. And we wanna talk about high level messages and the conversation may end, you know, go to pollinators, it may go to native plants, the conversation may go to insects or endangered species or whatever. But if you want to initially connect with people, we want to start the conversation, start the messaging with things we know they care about. Stay out of the weeds, focus on the quality of life messages. This is important, talk to people where they are at, not where you are at or where you want them to be. We learn about how important it is to start where people are. Talk to people where they're currently at. And people will move along the continuum at their own pace, not your pace. Again, connect preserving land with clean water, clean air. Also talk about how conservation solves problems. Flooding is a good example. Uh, communities that have a lot of flooding probably don't have a lot of open space. Um, talk about um, how, you know, bioswales and other kind of green infrastructure, although I'm not sure I'd throw the term green infrastructure out there to just anyone. But talk about how conservation can help solve problems, a green infrastructure versus gray infrastructure. Conservation makes my life better. We, we always try to talk about all this within the context of healthy communities and local, that this stuff helps us locally. This just isn't something we're doing out in, in Zion National Park or Yellowstone or the Everglades. This is right here where we live in the neighborhoods and the communities we live, raise our families and work in. And my final message is that we are winning. And by that, I mean the following. I get really frustrated when I hear my fellow conservation folks talk about that people don't care about this stuff. It is not true. All of the evidence shows that more people care about conservation and protecting our environment than don't. Now, you may have anecdotal experiences that is contradictory to that, 
But all I got to say is this. Not only does all the polling data show this, not, do all the, not just do all the surveys show this, but in the end, the proof that people care about this is when they go to the ballot box and they're being asked to voluntarily raise their taxes. And they don't want to raise their taxes but they're being asked to raise their taxes and pay for something. They're, they're paying for preserving more land. And they say yes. And when people say yes to that, that means they care about it, that it's a value to them. Now, I'm not saying that we don't have work to do. I'm not saying that we don't need to bring more people into the conservation tent. Of course we do. My background is in environmental ed. You know, that's, that's something we always have to do. But I'm telling you right now, is that we have to start with the understanding that people do like this stuff. And just because we're not the underdog anymore, it doesn't mean that, it means we have to talk about things differently. When we know that people like certain things, clean water, open space, we need to talk about that. And we need to understand that there are more people that like this than don't. And all of the evidence and all of the proof suggests that. So we need to get our happy face on, quit complaining that people don't care about this stuff. You may have people in your local community that don't. There are just people that don't care about this stuff. But I'm telling you right now, in the six suburban collar counties, people care about this more uh, than, than don't. So with that, that's something to think about. Uh, the messages are crystal clear, they're strong. How have the last few months affected these messages. I don't know. We don't have any data like that. It'd be interesting to get some data, but I can tell you this, whether it was through 9-11, through economic ups and downs, what 25 plus years of polling data has shown and the actual referenda passing is that people care about this stuff regardless of those other things going on. And these have passed, these referenda have passed during good times and bad times. So Jamie, with that, um, I am happy to take some questions. All right, great. We do have a few here, so um, let's get started. Christy asks, what was the socioeconomic makeup of the survey respondents? Yeah, so we did not, um, we did not specifically ask for uh, how much money people made and stuff. We, we have done that in the past and um, you know, and, and I'll probably anticipate some more questions like, why didn't you ask this or why didn't you ask that? There are two things that come into play when we're designing these, these questionnaires. One is time. You don't want to spend more than really 12 or 13 minutes with someone on the phone or you lose them. And the second one is money. The more questions you ask, the more, the more costs. And so um, when, we, when we do these, uh, these referenda, we try to pare it down to just the essentials. Saying that, what we have found is that um, most people will support a referendum if it is within a certain amount of money. So we've always used $2 a month. And clearly, um, there are people who are worried about feeding their families, and I totally get that. And what we have found is that there are people who will vote no for a referendum, even though they love the forest preserves, and they, and, and, and they love what the forest preserves stand for. But if you're having trouble feeding your family, you're probably gonna vote no for it. Um, so we don't have any specific socioeconomic data from this survey, but we do from some of the past. Okay, uh, the next question I believe is in reference to the one pie chart you had for doing a referendum when you had you know, the core opponents and, right. and the in favor. <clears throat> So the one in 10 core opponents, what were their demographic characteristics? Were there any similarities among them? Okay, what was the beginning of that question, Jamie? The, the, the core opponents. Yeah, okay. So their the core opponents tend to be older and conservative. That should not surprise anyone. Um, and again, I wanna emphasize that, you know, we have seen in our polling data over the years that older, more conservative voters uh, will strongly agree with all these statements. Yeah, clean water, yeah, clean air, open space, wildlife. I'm voting no. So that's not uncommon. No, people have philosophical issues about government and their taxes. 
And uh, so the, 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 the core opponents tend to be not so much people that can't afford it, they tend to be more conservative, older voters. And it's always been the case. And I wonder uh, if, you know, those are the kind of people you're never going to get to give money during an election, but it is possible that you'll get them to donate to nonprofits, for example, us who are looking for or who are working towards these goals. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, donating money to a charity is so different to some people than giving the government an extra 50 bucks a year or even an extra 50 cents a year. Agree or not, right or wrong, I'm not making any judgment. I'm just saying that there are a core group of people out there, regardless of the issue, they will never vote to raise their taxes, period. And that's okay. Fortunately, it was only 12%. Uh, Kathy asks, suggestions for applying these findings to discussions in the neighborhood about, for example, my funny looking pollinator garden and growing vegetables where folks can see them. Great, great question. Uh, Funny looking pollinator garden. Well, um, I have funny looking pollinator gardens in my yard and Jamie, you probably do too. Um, I will tell you that uh, funny little pollinator gardens attract attention. You know, my neighbors will go by my house and they'll look at my conservation at home sign or they'll, you know, they'll look at some of Liatris or something really pretty with a bunch of butterflies on it. And they ask questions and that's what we want. We want them to say, what kind of butterfly is that? Well, that's a monarch. Boom. Monarch conversation. Um, what are these pretty plants? Can I buy these at the store? Native plants. When I talk about native plants, I talk about attracting wildlife, beneficial wildlife, the butterflies and birds. Uh, you can get into a pollinator conversation. But Jamie, as you know, one of the greatest benefits of native plants is about water. We talk about water. You know, why doesn't my yard flood? You know, my yard's 80% native landscaping. So yeah, water. I talked about how important that was earlier. All right. Um, what people say when they know their answer is being recorded on a survey and what they do in practice are so drastically different. Where do we begin the conversation when it comes to practicing conservation friendly practices at home versus outside the home in a park or preserve? It's a great question. So um, we usually, in addition to the margin of error when we do this, we just be, we're just conservative and we, and we knock five points off of this stuff. And that's just sort of generally what we do. So we'll go into one of these, you know, sort of like a worst case scenario situation. Because this was a hypothetical referendum, we knocked an additional point. Um, uh, 10 points off. So when it talked about 76% at the end of the survey supported this, if I was running a campaign, I'd go in thinking it was 66, just to be conservative. But that's still two thirds. That's still uh, a lot. So yeah, you have to sort of understand um, that people do. There's sort of a, I forget what the pollster called it. It's like a survey psychology that people, for whatever reason, want to please the person asking them questions. So they're always a little bit more positive in their responses than how they really feel. And so I, I guess that's a real thing. And so we have to keep that in mind. What, what, what was the second part of that question? Um, how do we start that conversation when it comes to practicing conservation friendly practices at home? Okay, so um, some of you I'm sure are familiar with our conservation at home program. And it's a real simple way for people to do things at home. It has to be simple, it has to be inexpensive. And when we talk to people about doing something, whether it's putting a rain barrel on their downspout. It doesn't matter what they do, just do something. Do something simple and small, and then it grows from there. Because once you put one uh, rain barrel on the downspout, you'll say, well, that was pretty easy. I like this water. I keep running out of it. I need a second rain barrel. And so then they'll get a second rain barrel. And the same thing with uh, native uh, landscaping. Just plant a small little area. Watch nature come alive right in front of your eyes. And I guarantee it, people will most likely want to do more. I'm going to add to that area. I'm going to do additional. So we always talk about uh, do we, doing something, no matter what it is, doing something, start where, where people are at, do something, and start off small. And most of the time, people will get excited and want to do more. Yeah. People really do want to do something. People, I think, are sick and tired of hearing all the blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I get it. Environment's important. Just tell me what to do. I just want to do something. 
Well, and I think we can piggyback off the messaging that we discovered. So the ideas of clean water and all that. And, you know, for example, the rain barrel, another impetus for people there is the idea that you're saving water, or you're saving money in addition to saving water. Right. So I know there are some people who are like, man, I want to water my garden all the time, but I get this water bill. So giving them reasons beyond just, it gives you that warm, fuzzy feeling. No, it actually saves you money as well as conserving water makes them a little more likely to go along yeah. with it. Yeah, we found through um, uh, talking to the people that buy rain barrels from us, that most of them really don't care about anything else except saving water and, and, and saving money. And that's okay. Uh, Jenny wants to know, is there a good summary slash cheat sheet with the good and bad words and phrases to use with particular demographics? Uh, that's a great question. Particular demographics. I don't know that I have a cheap, sh cheap sheet, a cheat sheet, but I would suggest look at page, I don't have it in front of you, but like page three of the executive summary. If you just sort of photocopy that page, I think it almost doesn't really matter that much. I mean, people respond to all these really well. If, if, if you're really uh, working with a very specific type of, uh, of age group or demographic, uh, I can talk to you separately offline and I, I can sort of help you drill down to that level. And I'm gonna put that link back in the chat again. Um, so I, I just posted again, the link to that summary. So in case anybody came in late, it's there. Yeah, the first uh, three or four pages are really the high level important stuff. All right, Luann says, I'm considering applying for an appointed position on a municipal environmental committee. Any advice on if I'm appointed, how I best start? We'll talk about water. That'll help get you elected to begin with. Oh, no, no, this is appointed, appointed right? Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Um, uh, yeah, again, I go back to what we talked about earlier. Encourage people to do something. Doesn't matter what it is, just do something. And then encourage them to start small and then just sort of help, help them along the continuum at whatever pace they want to go to. Um, I mean, if you're within our four counties, we can help you with stuff like that. Yeah, and, and feel free to send us an email. Um, everybody should get my email on the follow-up and the uh, registration link on that. So email me anytime I can get you to the right person for that. Yeah, we, we work a lot with local officials, appointed, elected, a lot with municipalities, local units of government. We're a community-based conservation organization. So we're all about drilling down locally. And that, that's what Jamie does in Will County. That's her job, in addition to doing webinars now. Yes. Um, Kathy says she didn't know we sold rain barrels. So I'm going to go ahead and put the link to our rain barrels, that page on our website there. That's also going to show up on the resources page that you'll get to afterwards. But that's also in the chat now. Um, Luann wants to know, are you familiar with Blue Zones, National Geographic slash building healthy communities, getting them to move more? Any comments on this effort and the work you're doing? I am not familiar with it. I heard of, I've heard of it, but I am not familiar with it. Sorry. I'm not either. That's, that's new to me. I'm going to have to go look that one up. Um, Jennifer says, I have a neighbor who sprays their lawn for weeds two to three times a year. Any suggestions? <laughs> yeah, ask them to only do it once. <laughs> <laughs> and that does go into the that idea of starting small. You know, some people aren't willing to just stop doing it all together. They want to have that golf course looking lawn. So have a conversation and say, hey, maybe you can talk to the person who treats your lawn, um, make sure they're not using phosphorus and their fertilizers because that protects our waters. Or tell um, them to save money. Hey, yeah, you, exactly. You do it once a year, you'll have a beautiful yard and you'll save a lot of money. There you go. Excellent. And of course, our friend Gary Swick says, thank you for an analysis. Protect clean water. What percent of the public supports good beer? <laughs> well, I know that he and I do, and that's all that matters. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I think that is all we have. That's all the questions that I see. So uh, Luann provided us with a link to the Blue Zones project. Okay. So thank I will you. definitely check that out. Yeah, me too. Um, but once again, thank you so much to everybody who participated today. Uh, I hope you learned a lot here. I know I, I always get more ideas every time I hear this presentation. And um, we hope to see you back at future webinars on Thursday to hear about dark skies. And next Monday, look at that, water, and finding out how clean our streams are. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you. And 
we hope to see you again soon. All right, yeah, Jamie, Bye -bye. thank you. You guys take care.